Every March 17th, people the world over don their best green attire and celebrate what it means to be Irish in honor of St. Patrick's Day. But who was St. Patrick and was he even Irish? The answer might surprise you. In fact, the beloved apostle and patron saint of Ireland was not born on the Emerald Isle. But that's about all we know for sure. In Patrick's autobiography, he writes that he was born in a village called Bonavem Taberni. Patrick was born an aristocrat, and his family had a large estate. They were Christian, but the young boy showed little interest in religion. Soon, all that would change. At the age of 16, Patrick was kidnapped by a group of Irish raiders and would spend the next six years in captivity working as a sheep herder. Lonely and scared, Patrick turned to his family's religion for solace and became a devout Christian. As the story goes, one day he heard a voice which he believed to be God, telling him it was time to leave Ireland. After walking nearly 200 miles to Ireland's eastern coast, Patrick found passage on a ship. He sailed home to Britain and his family, but could not forget Ireland and the Irish people. In a dream, an angel told him to return to Ireland as a missionary. After years of study, Patrick was ordained as a priest and headed back to the island he had come to know as a prisoner. For the next 40 years, he would travel far and wide across Ireland, working to spread the Christian faith among the Celtic pagan population. After Patrick's death on March 17, 461, his legend only spread. Thanks to a mixture of truth and myth passed down through the centuries, he became a superhero of the Christian church and a symbol of Irish pride. There you go. Whether you're wearing green today or not, celebrating St. Patrick's Day or not, you're Irish or not, I think it's good that we know who St. Patrick is. He was, his story is intriguing, and it's, uh, some of it's myth and legend, like he banished all snakes from Ireland, and that's why there's no snakes in Ireland. Meteorologists tell us there's no snakes in Ireland because there's never been any snakes in Ireland, and they wouldn't do well in that climate. But let's give Patrick credit for it. And, and some other, he had the shamrock thing with the symbol for the Trinity, that there's three leaves on the plant, but there's one plant. Father, Son, Holy Spirit for each of the three leaves, one plant. So a teacher of the Trinity in that sense. That might, may or may not be true. true. We, aren't, we aren't sure uh, either way. But I want you, whether you celebrate St. Patrick's Day or not, I, I want you to know more about Patrick. So in addition to the video, let's dive in just a little bit because I think there's something for us to learn here. And more importantly, there's something for us to apply here to our own faith or our own call to faith. So here's a depiction of Patrick. There's his cathedral in New York City. There's the parades, the Green River, the whole thing. But the rest of the story, his real life is, is worth noting. It's intriguing. And there's something for us here to learn and to apply to our lives. I put in the green fonts, the, the kind of high points of his life, and the yellow, more cautionary font color, pauses or challenges or detours, some of them very difficult. He was born actually in Britain, as you saw in that video, not in Ireland. He's British, not Irish, but he was called to Ireland. In fact, the first time he went to Ireland, it wasn't his choice at all. He was taken captive. He was kidnapped. He was uh, t taken by a slave owner, Ruthless, who made him a shepherd and a slave in Ireland. It was an island filled with barbarians at the time. This is 5th century, the 400s AD. But while he's there from the age of 16 to 22, living a life as a slave, he becomes a fully devoted follower of Jesus. In the video, they rightly say that when Patrick was young, he, he was into other things more. I mean, today's Cyclone Celebration Sunday, right? I mean, who's excited about that? That was awesome. That was great. It's also a day when we celebrate the love of God through Jesus Christ. Okay, I got some work to do. <laughs> I'm really excited about that game, though. We didn't just beat Houston. We just destroyed the number one team in the nation for the second time this year. We beat them out of three. We should be a number one seed, but we won't be because that's the NCAA. But there, there's, a whole, there's a whole thing. I mean, Houston, you have a problem is, is what's really going on here. And we exposed it. We, like I'm on the team now. We exposed your problem last night. But Patrick started living his life when he was a little kid for things that were bigger than God. And it's easy to do. And it's not just kids. It's the biggest temptation in this world is to make something else your God. To be more passionate about something else. To, to care more about something else. To put even the cyclones, and there's nothing wrong with the cyclone. I'm, I'm pro-cyclone. But, but with what the cyclones above faith in God. 
is where we can start to lose our way. But when he was a young man, he became a fully devoted follower of Jesus because he realized there was nothing in this world that it could offer that could help him overcome the obstacle of living a life as a slave. He needed more. And the reality is a lot of us have times in life where our dreams go dark, when we're up against it, when we're facing a, an obstacle, a suffering, a detour that's so big, we don't know how we're going to cope. The good news is, is there is a way, and Patrick found it, and it was through a relationship with Jesus Christ. But then, and the video talked about this, he took a 200-mile journey to the shore of Ireland, escaped with some other slaves, but the part that the video leaves out is they got shipwrecked on the way, and this is all in Patrick's autobiography, and they ended up in a British island that they didn't know where it was, and, and there was no civilization there, and they didn't have any food, and they were starving, and so Patrick told everybody, you got to pray. We have to trust God on this. God provided. God provided some, some wild pigs, uh, uh, some boars who, who showed up, and they were able to eat, and they survived, and they made it back to Britain. And you say, okay, and he lived happily ever after. Well, not exactly. He was lost, and now he's found. But then he becomes a monk, because now he's really all in, and he, he, it doesn't mean if you're all in, you have to become a priest or a monk or a pastor or a missionary, but that was Patrick's sense, that that's what God had made him to do. Whatever it is you do, if God's called you to it, that's what you should be doing. And be an ambassador for Jesus Christ in your office, in your workplace, in your school, in your social circles, amongst your friends, wherever you have interaction with people. But for Patrick, it was to become a monk, to become a priest. And so he studied, he poured into it, and then he received the call from God, which is very exciting. And so I put it in green. Study I put in yellow, because sometimes reading theology isn't that easy. It's like chewing glass in the middle of the night and there's volumes and volumes of stuff to read and then you got to learn Greek and if it's Greek to you, it was Greek to me at one time too. And so Patrick's learning all this stuff so that he won't just stand up in front of people and wing it and say, well, I decided to become a pastor or a missionary or a monk or a priest because I read the Bible once and I liked it. Any more than you'd want to go to a doctor who says, I, I took eighth grade health and I liked it. And so now I've got all sorts of ideas for how you should, you know, take care of your health. It's good to have somebody like Patrick who actually had studied it, and study is hard. But then he gets the call, and he gets it in a dream, a vision from God, who, and he writes about this in his autobiography. He says, an angel named Victorious came to me and gave me a letter, and I opened up the scroll of the letter, and it said, Patrick, God is personally calling you to be a missionary in Ireland. Ireland where Patrick walked 200 miles and got shipwrecked and survived just to escape captivity. Go back. Go back, God says. Talk about not necessarily an easy call, so the excitement of getting a vision from God turns into a cautionary yellow font. Mission work is tough, and sure enough, Patrick was persecuted as a missionary. He was imprisoned. His life was threatened multiple times, but he persevered. He endured. He continued to forge on. He pressed on. I press on toward the goal, the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament. Because it's who God has made me to be. So he carries out his mission work and he leaves a legacy. I would suggest that probably some of you are Christians today because of Patrick, at least in small part, that he planted the seeds of faith in, a, in an island of the world, Ireland at the time, that had no Christianity. In the same way that we're planting seeds of faith through our giving to the Hope for Africa project during these six weeks of Lent leading up to Easter. Next week is Holy Week already. We'll have worship night next Saturday night, and then all of our Palm Sunday services next Sunday morning and evening, and then it's Holy Week and Easter the week after that. We want to share the good news of Easter. We want to share the good news of Christ's life, death, and resurrection with people who don't know it. That's what Patrick did in Ireland. That's what we're trying to do in northern Ghana during these six weeks of Lent. Did you see during the Hope 360 video that played earlier in the service, our missionary pastor Sam said, Hope, you've already raised funds over the last 10 or 15 years to plant 600, what did he say, 616 or something like that, new churches in towns and cities and villages that have never had Christianity before? That's what Patrick did. That's what you're doing. Have that in your heart, mind, and soul as you pray about what God wants to do through through you through this special offering. Our goal is to give a half a million dollars to build as many churches as that can build at $4,000 a crack. This is just a model, by the way, a replica. The, the real churches are much bigger than this. 
And on average, each one of these churches that we built has somewhere between 600 and 1,000 people showing up every Sunday for church in a community where they didn't even know about Christ before. I'm telling you, we are called to not just be consumers of God's light and his word and his love and his grace, but to be servants of it, to be reflectors of that light, to let our light shine out into the world. And it isn't always going to be easy. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be mountaintops and valleys. And sometimes the valley will be like the deepest, darkest valley of the shadow of death, as Psalm 23 says. That's what Patrick had to endure, but he left a legacy because seeds of faith were planted in, in the 5th century A.D. in, 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 in Ireland. And, and there, most of the whole island of Ireland today is Christian because of Patrick. And if you have Irish descent and you're a Christian, it's probably because Patrick brought Jesus to Ireland. And the faith has been passed on from generation to generation to generation to you. I mean, it makes a difference. And it's not just, oh, well, I'm a Christian instead of something else. It's new life and everlasting life, a gift that will keep on giving forever. That's what we're trying to do here, church. We're not playing church. We're not just present. We're not just showing up for the sake of showing up. We want to be ready to roll. We want to be ready to go. And so Patrick said, this is how I endure. It's Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Does that describe your religious life, your spiritual life, your Christian life? Does that describe the way you live? Does that describe your life? Or is Christ just something you think about when you go to church? Because I'm telling you, if you can start to not just learn from Patrick's story, but apply this famous quote of his that's engraved in the wall of the St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, it would change everything. This is the point at which Jesus moves from Savior to Savior and Lord. And literally, Lord means the one who calls the shots for us, the one that we trust enough to show us his way. I want you to, and I love that a lot of you take notes. I can see you up here. I want you to put your notes down just for a, a second. You can pick up your pens again in a minute. Or if you're not a note taker, I want you to do this too. Just, just look at this quote from Patrick and soak it up. And think about what it means that when you're on the mountaintops and you're on the valleys, the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs, whatever this upside down world throws at you, and some of you are up against it right now, you're face to face with challenges that are so big you're wondering how you can cope, how you can get through this next week, how you can make it, how, you, how you're going to be able to come out of it with, with, with any semblance of, of being okay. And you're looking at it and you wonder, how am I going to make it? But if that's not you, you say, well, actually, things are going pretty good for me. I mean, I, I, everything's kind of like, this is a great time of year. It's spring, new life all around me. And, and my teams are winning. Work is good. School is good. Friendships are good. Social life's good. It's all good. Still, soak this up. Wherever you are, the highs, the lows, or anywhere in between, do you live a God-conscious life? Do you live a life that's focused on a Christ who is present with you? The, the question is not, is Christ beside you, before you, behind you, in you, beneath you, above you? And then Patrick goes on. It's dot, dot, dot there. He says, Christ to my right, Christ to my left. Christ in every word that I hear. Christ in every, every one that I see. Christ, Christ as an opportunity to be an ambassador for Jesus wherever I go. He goes on and on and on. And the way only a preacher can, Right? He, he says this to tell us, to remind us, to remind himself. We're never alone. You are never alone. You're never up against an enemy that God can't defeat. Jesus Christ is in your corner. You are not standing against these enemies by yourself. Neither am I. If we were, we'd have no hope. We'd only have despair. But we have a champion who comes to fight for us. We have a champion in our corner. We have a victor. We have somebody who's over it all. So when Patrick had his life threatened for the umpteenth time, he's like, I'm good. When the apostle Paul was imprisoned and ultimately executed because of his Christian faith, what does he write? Rejoice with me. I know I'm going to die for the cause of Jesus Christ, but I have joy 
Because I've got something that lasts forever. I've got substance and depth to my relationship with God. I don't have a Christianity where I just show up and I'm present. I have a Christianity where I'm ready to go. Let's go. Let's move. So soak it up. Jesus Christ is with us. Throughout this series of sermons during the season of Lent called The Heart of God, I, I'm, I'm pausing to step back because I, I want you to see how the puzzle pieces fit together. We're a church after God's own heart. That's our theme for this year. But in order to be a church after God's own heart, it's really important that we don't invent what we want God's own heart to be about. That we discover what Scripture, God's timeless truth, reveals. That this is the heart of God. And so here's the sermon titles for the five weeks. We're on week five right now. Next week is Palm Sunday and then Easter. Week one, it was Life Maker. God's a creator. So the second line of each week is just to summarize for you so you can see the pieces fitting together, the theological concept, it's creation. The third line is what God gives us. He gives us a paradise on earth, a garden of Eden, everything we need to live and survive in this world, on this beautiful blue planet. The next week he shows up as the one who makes a deal, a covenant to bond with us, a connection with us. He gives us an old covenant. I'll be your God, you'll be my people. Here's Here's my, my boundaries for you, my laws that are a blessing for you. If you follow these and stay inside of these, you won't end up crying. Because we've all been there. We know how it feels. <laughs> but if you stay inside the boundaries of my, my rules, my law, my commandments, it'll be a blessing to you. You'll have better relationships with people. You'll have better relationships with God. You'll have a better life, you'll be full, you'll be rich in, in, in a deeper way than just how much money you have. But we wander away from the old covenant, we wander away from this deal. So God starts to, to raise up prophets like Jeremiah, I preached on that a couple weeks ago, who says, here's the old covenant, it was written on stone tablets, but the new covenant, I'll write it on your hearts. Behold, the days are coming when I'll give you a new covenant, it won't be like the old one. It'll be based on me showing up for you. So God makes this promise as the Lord of tomorrow to redeem us by, through this new covenant. And then promise made week three, promise kept last week. Pastor Jeremy and others preached last week about this party crasher, Jesus, who, who, who's the fancy word theological for Christmas is incarnation. God shows up. He breaks through into our world. And so the gift is his presence. And now this week, for the rest of this sermon, we're talking about the deepest levels of Christian faith, biblically speaking, where God says, okay, I'm your savior, now I wanna be your Lord. I wanna flip the world for you. I wanna, I wanna flip the script. I, I wanna show you what matters most. When I was in ninth grade, I had an algebra teacher, uh, Dr. Pearson, who was really passionate. He says, he had his doctorate in mathematics, and. He wanted to teach ninth grade algebra as, as students are just kind of getting into the, to the deeper levels of math more than he wanted to teach university mathematics. He says, I want to get them before they leave, <laughs> before they wander away from mathematics. And he influenced me heavily, inspired me. First day of algebra, ninth grade, he takes roll. He reads our names, alphabetical order by last name, and I don't know why he waited to get to my name, but he gets to householder. Householder, I said, present. Everybody else before me said, present, or here, here, present, here, present. And with me, I guess I'm sitting in the front at the time because of alphabetical, that's where I just happened to land. He looks at me and he says, listen, I don't just want you to be present. I want you to be ready. I told you he was quirky and, and passionate. He said, I want you to be ready to listen. I want you to be ready to learn. I want you to be ready to discover the, the brilliance of mathematics. I, I, I want you to be all, I want you to come prepared. I want you to have done your homework. I want you to be ready for the next lesson. I don't want you just to show up. I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready to go. So from now on, when I take attendance in this class, and he would do it every day, I want you to, when I call your name, I don't want you to say here present. I want you to shout out because you mean it. Ready? So I did. The rest of the semester, household, ready? <laughs> Even though the dog ate my homework. I'm ready. Let's go. I was so influenced by Dr. Pearson, I started college as a mathematics major. It didn't last. 
<laughs> but I really still enjoy it, sort of, until I got to Calc 2. I did not enjoy Calc 2. That wasn't yellow, that was red. That was like full stop, do some, God, call it, God made you for something else. Okay, Christian, God's taken role. It's great you showed up today. You're present. You're here. Are you ready? Are you ready to go home and apply God's word? To live it out? To let him be Lord? To let him call the shots? To let him be the God above all the other things that we live for? That we're passionate about? That we live for him? To trust him enough so that when he shows up through the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnation, that he's present. What does Jesus say at the heart of his teaching? John chapter 14, he says, I am the way. He doesn't say I'm a way. I'm one of many wonderful options of how to live your life. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then he goes on to, has the audacity to say, and you can't get to God unless it's through my way. You say, well, that sounds so exclusive and so harsh and so, so, so hateful. Not if it's true. Then it's the most loving thing he could possibly say. In fact, it would be the opposite of loving for him not to say it if it was true. And it is. I'm the way. What if well-meaning as our world is, everything we've been taught by the world for our whole lives in so many different ways, what if it's wrong? What if the goal of life is not to cross the finish line first, the ultimate goal? It can be a goal, but the goal? What if the goal in life is not to get the biggest house? What if the goal in life is not to make the most money? What if the goal in life... Social scientists say that people are becoming more and more depressed in our culture, and they're finding a link between social media and that growing levels of disparity. Because their theory is when we go on social media, we play the comparison game. I'm doing pretty good, and now I'm going to scroll through Instagram or TikTok or Twitter or Facebook or, what, or X, sorry, or whatever. I'm, I'm going to go through all these threads. I'm going to go to uh, spot, uh, what, you know, what I, I'm going to go through it all. And the more I scroll, the more I start, I can't help. I start to compare myself, and I start to see I'm not always winning. Some people are winning more, and then... What happens to us is even worse. We start to like grow envy for the people who are getting what we wanted. And we, we play this comparison game and it comes out sideways in so many different directions. No wonder we have so much despair, even though we're more connected socially than we've ever been in the history of planet Earth. But we keep comparing, we're like, well, I wish I had that. I, I wish I could do that. I wish I could get a picture like that on there. I wish, I wish my life was like that. I wish, I wish that was it. Instead of wanting to celebrate with people who have big announcements to make or happy days to talk about on social media, instead of hitting the like and, wow, that's great, and really mean it, our sinful human nature is like, I can't stand that person anymore. I don't want to deal with it. I don't even want to see their stuff anymore. It's just too hard to look at. And the only reason we'd feel that way is because we have bought into what the world's taught us our whole lives, that the only way to really succeed in life is to get more, make more, consume more, take in more, win more, cross more finish lines first, get more promotions, make it to the very top. What if the top is bottom? What if up is down and down is up? And this is not just a preacher trying to coin a phrase for you today. This is Jesus. If you want to be the greatest in my kingdom, Jesus says, this is radical. I told you it's not going to get more challenging or deeper than this. If you want to be the greatest, I mean truly the greatest in life, then you will become the chief servant. If you want to be first, then you're going to be what? Come on, Bible readers. If you want to be first, you have to be. For the first will be last and the last will be first. What if Jesus meant that? What if he taught that because he had our best interests at heart? And he wasn't just trying to say, show me some sacrifice. For the sake of sacrifice. What if he was saying, I didn't make you for what the world says you're made for? What if up is down and down is up? What if the well meaning world around us has it wrong? What if there's something more to live for? What if we were made for more? 
than just crossing the finish line first. Jesus comes along and he says, check your attitude. Check, 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 check which way is up. When I was in my 40s, we took our kids, they were high school age at the time, we took them to, or just a little younger than that, we took them to Worlds of Fun in Kansas City. And I got on this ride that I don't even know what it's called. I think it was called the Torture the Pastor Ride. <laughs> it went up, it went down, it spun around, it went side to side, and then you were in this like capsule that flipped around and somehow seven, it just went all sorts of different directions. And halfway into the ride, I remember I started to laugh because I felt like crying. Because this ride is not made for a six foot five inch middle aged man. When I was a kid, I loved these rides. And then something happens to the equilibrium. Or, or it happened to me anyway. And I'm in this ride and I'm just laughing because I thought, I, I seriously thought, this is a confession, I'm not proud of this, but I thought, I would welcome death right now. <laughs> it's one of the few times in my life where I've actually felt that way and meant it and thought it was it really actually would be an improvement over what was happening to me in the moment because I didn't know which way was up. If you're a pilot or you like aviation, you know this is an attitude indicator. It tells you which way is up. It tells you if your wings are in the right place. It tells you if you're tilted too far one way or the other. It tells you which way is up. What if up is down and down is up? Jesus comes along in his most famous sermon and he says, radical, up is down and down is up. Blessed are you when people insult you. What if somebody came up to you like on Tuesday this week? You'd be happier if you got insulted more. You'd have a better life if, if people were uttering all kinds of evil about you because of your Christian faith, because of me. You, you would find the life you've always been looking for if you just had more challenges in your life, if you were just up against it more. Blessed are you. Word of God, not word of Pastor Mike, word of Jesus Christ. Blessed are you when people insult you. Before that, he says famously, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers, not the victors, the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake. Because of your faith. If you have the kind of Christianity where you never get any pushback, with all the love in my heart, truly with all the love in my heart, because I really do love you, are you living out your Christian faith if you never get any pushback from this world who doesn't understand Jesus? If someone somewhere along, along the way, either directly or indirectly, tells you, communicates to you, hey, turn that down. Slow your roll with Jesus there a little bit. Pump the brakes. You do your little religious thing in, the, in, in private, over in a corner where it doesn't have any influence on the world. Let the world take care of the big things. Let us handle the big issues in this world all by ourselves with the wisdom of this world. What if the wisdom of this world is wrong? I don't say that meaning the wisdom of this world is trying to maliciously like deceive everybody. Sometimes it is. But sometimes the wisdom of this world is well-meaning. So this is what I want to pass on to my kids. Cross the finish line first. Be on the top podium. Get, get the promotion. Get into the best school. What if those things are good but they aren't the ultimate goal. The, the, that when they become the ultimate goal, we end up as the most depressed American culture in the history of American culture. What if it's because the world and what we've been hearing and learning from the world is wrong? What if there's a better way? What if Jesus meant it when he says, I'm the better way and I'm the deeper truth and I'm the way to the more abundant life? And you can't get to God unless you come my way, because my way is so radical. Which reminds us, it doesn't matter if we're up or down, winning or losing. In times when we feel so socially connected, it's great. In times when we feel completely alone. Blessed are you, happy are you. The Greek word in the original text is makarioi, untouchable joy. Doesn't depend on how things are going for you this week. Do you have that? Because you will get it as soon as you let Jesus become Lord. Not just Savior, but Lord. You trust him enough to say, I'm, do, I'm in for you, and I'm all in for you, Jesus. There is no bigger God in my life. There is no bigger goal. There is no bigger idol. There is no bigger objective. I'm here for you. I'm here. Put me in. I'm not just present. I'm ready. Through his word today, God's taking role, and he gets to my name, householder, and if I just say, present, I'm here at church today. 
Great. But I think what he's really looking for is, I'm ready. I'm ready. Show me your ways, God, so I can walk with you. I'm tired of following the ways of this world and, and where to, even when I win, I notice it doesn't satisfy my soul. E- even when I, and when I get it all, there's nothing wrong with being rich, but if you really want to rejoice, there's that word again, makario. I translate it as blessed and rejoice in English. It's the same word. Untouchable joy is yours. You can be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Because you have a relationship with God that means no matter what you're up against, you remember you're never alone. Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ above me, Christ to my right, Christ to my left, Christ within me. And if we can live that way, it changes everything. Take a close look. Which way is really up? Which button goes which way? Because we might assume, oh, the top button goes up, but look closer. And you're like, ooh. I thought I was going up, but it's actually taken me the wrong way. I want to be really clear about this. This does not mean if you're rich, you're going the wrong way. Jesus didn't say blessed are the poor and the rich aren't blessed. We can turn money into an idol whether we're rich or poor. He's just, he's just flipping the earth. He's just telling us, if you think you have to be rich in order to be blessed, you're sadly mistaken. You weren't made just to consume, you were made to serve even before you were made to consume. You were made for more than just get more for me. No wonder we have so much despair. We're living for the wrong goals. So Jesus comes to Jericho and the richest man in the whole city is up in a sycamore tree, Zacchaeus, because he's curious. Isn't that interesting? The richest man in Jericho, why would he even bother coming out to meet this religious leader? What's missing in his life? It's not money. He's not missing any money. He's got all the money he could ever want and then some. Why is he looking for something more in his life? Because he's been living for the wrong things. The world taught him wrong. And he succeeded. And he found out it wasn't enough. And so Jesus knows, and he sees Zacchaeus, and instead of hanging out with all the religious people who are already doing good, He says, I'm a physician. I'm here for sick people, not people who are well. Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. And Zacchaeus' life has radically changed. By the end of the story, after lunch with Jesus, Zacchaeus says, you're my Lord. You're not just my Savior. You're my Lord. I'll give half of my money to the poor. I'll give give every, every penny back to anybody I ever stole from. Times four. Zacchaeus' whole life has changed. Jesus says, I can tell where your heart is by where your treasure is. We can say, oh, Jesus, I'm all in with you, but I'm not going to give you any of my money. It's not my money. If it was my money, I could take it with me when I die. It's money I'm given by God to manage and to steward while I'm here. So we want to be a Zacchaeus church, a 50-50 church. That's always our goal. Where half of the, every dollar you give to this church, our goal is half of it will go out to our mission partners around the world and right here in Des Moines. To those who much has been given, much is expected in return, the Bible says. And we are a big church, and there are a lot of affluent people in this church, and we don't want you to give more so we can get more. Our salaries are set based on a big national survey and how much money comes in in offerings doesn't influence at all how much the staff gets paid here. It's all set. It takes all the pressure off. We're here to be a church after God's own heart. We don't want to be manipulative about that. We don't want to play games around that. We don't want to be like, hey, you know, you should give more. You should give more to Africa. You should give more to Hope. You should do these things so we can get more. No, we want you to give more so we can give more so that we can be a Zacchaeus church, so we can give half of it away to the poor, so that we can be a church after God's own heart, so that we can let Jesus be Lord. Salvation has come to this home today, Jesus says, in the end of the story of Zacchaeus. Transformation has also come to this home today. He's finally discovered what he was made for. We call this circle of spiritual growth here our discipleship track at Hope. Pastor Amanda preached about this so eloquently a month ago. I just want to put a kind of an exclamation point on it for you today. A lot of us come in as seekers. We don't know what to believe about God. We hear the word of God from scripture and we become believers. Faith comes by hearing. We hear the word, we accept it, and then we produce a harvest. It's exactly what Jesus said at the end of the parable of the sower. Hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. 
a, a multiplied crop, a hundred times more than the little tiny seed you started with. And that happens. It happens when our lives are transformed, when Jesus moves from Savior to Savior and Lord. We hear God's word, we become believers. And Jesus is our Savior. But when we accept God's word and we let Jesus become Lord, now we're following Jesus' way. And if we follow Jesus' way, naturally, the very next step, you almost can't stop yourself once you get here, is you're going to look around and you're like, put me in, coach. What what can I do to serve your kingdom? Because I was made for that. First and foremost, you don't have to quit your job. You don't have to be like Patrick and become a missionary to Ireland or anywhere else. Unless God calls you to do that, then that's what you got to do. But be an ambassador of Jesus Christ in your workplace, in your school, in your social circles, wherever you go. Let your light shine. Hear the word accepted, and when you accept it, you start to produce, and you become a servant leader. Two quick things I want you to note about this circle of spiritual growth at Hope. First of all, place yourself on this circle. Honestly, between you and God, where are you? Seeker, believer, follower, servant leader? So the first thing is is I want you to notice that you work your way to the bottom. You don't work your way to the top. This is not a stairway to heaven. This, This is a move down. So that when you become a leader in God's kingdom, you become the chief servant, just like he said. The first will be last. You become a servant leader. The second thing I want you to note about this is this is a circle. When Chris Canary, our operations minister, and I, about 10 years ago, we went to the Newton Speedway because we wanted to do that. We're both race fans. We wanted to do that drive thing where you get to pretend you're a race car driver for an afternoon. We had the day off and we're like, oh, let's go. We got to do this. So we went out, they have instructors, they put you in a fire suit, they give you a helmet that's way too small, and and then you get in the car and and you go. And they only let you go so fast. I think they've got a pace car out in front of you that's going like 125. At that track, they're usually going 165, 175. So they, you know, insurance reasons, they're, they're, they're scaling it way down. So we had two sessions. At the end of the first sessions, they give you your statistics. They print them out to shame you and embarrass you. Or to shame me, Chris Canary looks at his, average speed 121 miles an hour. Mike Householder, average speed 82. (laughs) I drove faster on the way to Newton than I did (laughs) on the track. Do you know why? Because of that wall, that cement wall, the concrete wall that's all the way around the track. And I've seen enough races on TV to know when you hit that wall, that's not good. And so I'm driving 82 and it's not very fun. And I knew I was going slow. I couldn't even keep up with the pace car. He's like, come on, let's go. You see him waving out the window, pick it up. At halftime, the instructor comes to me and he, he was like from I don't know, Talladega, Alabama or something, because he had the accent. He says, just man a few words. And he says, you know, he looks at my numbers. He says, you know, these cars are happier when they go fast. (laughs) (laughs) And he said, I see you staying inside the wall by about 25 yards. (laughs) You can trust the car. We're not going to let you go too fast. And I believed him. And I got back in the car, and the next time around, I passed the pace car and went 210 miles. No, I, that's a lie. <laughs> I wish. But I was like 116. I was almost in Chris Canary range. And it was so, it was, as soon as the car passed 100 miles an hour, it went from that <laughs> shaking and rattling around to silky smooth. He was right. That car was made to roll, it was made to go fast. Hey, Christian, you weren't made just to sit there, just to be present at church. You were made to roll. I know it's cool these days. Slow your roll. Pump the brakes. Jesus is saying the opposite through his word today. Get rolling. Go. Get moving. Green flag. Hit the gas pedal. Move. This is a circle. You never graduate and say, well, I made it. You keep moving, you keep seeking, you keep listening to God's word, you keep keep rolling, and and the faster you go, the better. Roll, move, go, church. There was a track athlete who really rolled back in the early 90s. His name is Derek Redmond. 
He was on the 4x4 world championship team from Great Britain where Patrick was born. The, one, the fastest 4x4 team in the world. And going into the Olympics, he was going to do the individual four because he was the fastest 400 meter guy on the fastest 4x4 team. And he was one of the top two or three favorites to win the gold medal. What could be better than that? There's nothing wrong with striving for gold medals or living for that bit. What Derek learned is there's something that could be way better than that. What he learned is to apply this verse from Jesus. Whoever wants to be first, I mean for real, you want to be first in this world? In God's kingdom and for eternity? You have to be willing to take last. To become the chief servant. To work your way to the bottom. Derek Redman gets to the Olympics and everything's going great. He goes through the preliminary rounds. He's, he's running so fast, the last 50 meters of each preliminary round, he starts jogging and he still finishes first. He's that gifted. He's that talented. He's that athletic. He's that fast. He gets to the semifinal round and now there's only 16 runners left who have a chance for the gold in the whole world. And all he has to do is finish in the front half and he's highly favored to do that. Shouldn't be a problem at all. And then this happens. High up above or down below When you're too low to let it go But if you never try, you'll never know Just watch you won the gold medal in the 400 meters in Barcelona? Me neither. What if the world has it wrong? What if the gold medalists aren't remembered for very long? But ESPN just said that moment recently said is one of the top three most inspiring moments in the entire history of the Olympic Games. Derek Redmond taking last place. The crazy guy who came alongside of him at the end jumped out of the stands to help him get to the finish line. His dad, Derek's dad. <laughs> I hope you have a dad like that or you had a dad like that. Maybe you didn't and that's a raw deal. You deserved one, but you've got one. And he's even better than Derek's dad. He's the God who made you and loves you. And now we call him Abba, Father. A better literal translation would be Abba, Daddy, of the original text, that we would not be the formal father, but the informal daddy. That's who God is for you, the Bible says. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. You are his daughter, God's daughter. You are God's son. You are a child of God. So whatever you're up against, whether you're in the high highs like Patrick had or the low lows like Patrick had or anything in between on this St. Patrick's Day, 
God's got you. Christ before you. Christ behind you. Christ within you. Christ on your right. Christ on your left. Christ wherever you go. Not just Christ to meet you here on Sundays at church. Oh, he meets us here in a particularly holy way. And this is essential according to God's word and his command for the Christian life. But it isn't just being Christian here. It's being Christian when you go home. It's being Christian on your way home. It's being Christian all week long, an ambassador for Jesus Christ, letting your light shine, knowing that you're never walking alone, knowing whether you finish first or last. That stuff isn't gonna last. But we live, the Apostle Paul says, for a prize that's gonna be for eternal life, that's never gonna be tarnished, that's never gonna end. So what does Paul say at the very end of his life in the New Testament? He says, I've kept the faith. I've fought the good fight. I finished the race. And it has nothing to do with what the world says you need to do in order to win. The real winners are the ones who know, I was made for more. I was made by a God who has a purpose and a plan for me. Talk to God about this. Discover his call for your life. Live it out. Right in the office where you work, the school where you go, the social circles you hang out in. Or if God's calling you to do something new, then do something new. Trust him. Trust the car. Christian, you're going to be a whole lot happier if you would start rolling. If you would start activating your faith, if you would start moving, if you could let Jesus not just be Savior, but let him be Lord. Amen? Let's stand up as children of God and give our Heavenly Father praise, the God who's with us wherever we go. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for Service Online. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We don't think it's any accident that you're here and we have been praying for you. To see more of our content, know when we go live and stay up to date week to week, feel free to subscribe to this channel. And if you live close by one of our campuses or local sites, we invite you to check us out in person. We would love to meet you. And don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date. See you next week.